Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. And if you are a multifamily investor, really any kind of real estate investor, well, you're in the right spot because every week on The Gray Report, we're breaking down all of the latest research reports, the data that comes out, as well as articles and throwing out some original opinions on everything multifamily, real estate, and the macro economy. I'm joined by Matt Bosnagel, Director of Communications and Marketing here at Gray Capital. Some incredible reports that you're going to want to stick around to the end to listen and hear about stuff from on the capital markets from Newmark. We're looking at has rent grow peak. Uh, Real page has an opinion. MSCI has a report on the real estate, how it's changed since the pandemic. Redfin has a migration report, incredibly important. And then we're going to be looking at what is Adam Newman, formerly of WeWork. He says he's going to disrupt the multifamily industry. What does that even mean? Well, we've got some inside the inside scoop and some uh, some theories to try to wrap it all together. Let's get into the report. All right, back on the report. Matt, thanks again for Hello. joining us week after week, breaking everything down for what's what's happened in the multifamily industry. Yeah. Um, and one thing that we're not talking about this week is inflation, and I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's a, a little bit of a breather. That's a true. little bit of a we breather. We could we could spend another hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, just talk, just inflation and Fed watch. No, but we've yeah. got some more. I, I think a more uh, kind of holistic kind of view and some more yeah. unique pieces getting into kind of what the capital market activity is in the multifamily industry in all commercial real estate asset classes. Yeah. Um, but I'm really excited to get to this piece on Adam Newman because I know you've got um, a couple of opinions. Not uh, none publicly said yet. So nah. maybe the hottest of the hot take. I, 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 Matt <laughs> hasn't told me yet. He says, I've got a really good theory about this. It's I've been be, tracking be this for a while. And I was like, okay, well, what's the theory? And I was like, hold on, stop. Just let's just do it live <laughs> on, on the, on the show. And I think that'll be a lot more fun. Um, but, Week's going well so far, Matt. What's, yeah, what's yeah. new? What's new in the, uh, in the you Boston know? I was I world. thought there'd be nothing new, and then and then these reports came up. There's no uh, nothing hugely new in the Boston novel world. Okay, which is nice. That's, that's a, <laughs> sometimes that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's pop right into seeing what's going on in capital markets. Um, all right, capital markets report real estate trends and analysis for all property types. Um, we're always looking forward to this report, um, Matt. What are some of the highlights? Yeah, it was um, like you said. It's it was it's good to dive back into commercial real estate after you know we kind of covered a lot of the broader economy, which mm -hmm. is important. But um, getting into how how these different property types have performed and are performing is is really nice. And um, Newmark does a really great job of uh, of giving us the fuller scope of the CRE markets in their twenty five page report. Um, NAR used to have a monthly report on their commercial markets, and they don't they don't do that anymore. Mm. For I wonder, the past wonder, three wonder why that is. Maybe staffing. I don't know. <laughs> staffing. Yeah, we, we, we can we can reach. But uh, out. yeah, new so Newmark is carrying um, is is carrying the burden now, and, and I very much appreciate the the report that they released this month. Um, yes, you may not get the same level of detail as a multifamily focused report if you're looking for that kind of granular market. Um, information, but multifamily does not exist in a vacuum, and a lot of these real estate sectors have a lot of influence on each other. Whether that's through directly attracting investors or through more indirect effects on a market or the economy, um, and you know, it just says here in the headline uh, is that the commercial real estate investment remains bifurcated, with multifamily and industrial taking the lion's share of investment and really um, the lion's share of returns. The multifamily has has gotten more investor attention, but uh, industrial has a lot more returns for at least 20 and 2021. And we'll kind of get into that in a second here. Yeah. I mean, people are continuing to pile in. I mean, certainly not an exodus of capital. I mean, quarterly yeah. investment volume increased by 17 and a half percent year over year um, to 190 billion in the second quarter of 22. Um, now that it wouldn't have been surprising, you know, 2020 to 2021 because mm -hmm. like, you know, people were sitting on their hands in 2020, but 2021, there's a lot of investment activity. So that's just showing how it's picked up, um, and hasn't dropped off even that's a really in the rising point. interest rate, um, in environment. So I think that's, you know, and again, but to your point, Matt, Matt multifamily remained the most sought after property type in commercial real estate in the pandemic era with volume increasing by 42% year over year, um, to 86.3 billion. Um, so out of that 190, multifamily makes up 86. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's incredible. And and it's interesting to see how much Dallas as a specific market attracted. Mm -hmm. Well, just think about, you know, we looked at the report last week of, you yeah. know, the delivery pipeline and, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, I think is the, the market that has the most um, supply coming online. Also, some of the best, you know, in migration in the country as well. 
I guess we'll learn more about that uh, later on on the Redfin report. Um, but yeah, Dallas attracted the most investment volume in the U.S. Um, Eleven billion just in Dallas, and fifty-six. Uh, and that's that. Eleven is all asset classes, but fifty-six percent of that. So you know, oh, okay, sorry, a little yeah. bit over. You know, around you know six million or so, five and a half million directly to multi billion directly to multifamily. Um, some of the fastest growing Sunbelt markets are Charlotte, Nashville, and Tampa. Um, and then New York City is the largest kind of gateway market. No surprise um, there. Dry powder has risen. So people are looking at deals and still haven't been able to. There's more money than deals still. That has not changed. It's been the yeah. case for a little while now. Um, it says following an all time record year for capital deployment, dry powder accumulated by North American focused real estate funds rose to 250. $3.5 billion in Q2 of 2022. Opportunistic and value-add strategies mm -hmm. make up 60% of this dry powder. Um, it says now, however, this is in part too many core and core plus funds falling under the open-ended structure to accommodate longer holding periods. And again, I think a lot of those kind of strategies are, it's, it, there's, when I see, again, like opportunistic, a lot of that um, is development, but then some of it yeah. is, you know, just kind of being opportunistic and what, and what we're going after. Yeah. And then, you know, value add is kind of a broad category. There's some core plus that falls into that. So I kind of look at opportunistic value add and kind of core plus is kind of at least the kind mm -hmm. of realm that great capital plays in. Yeah. Um, record breaking pace of non-traded REIT spending has continued in 2022 with investment volume surpassing. 23.2 billion in just the first half of this year driven by Blackstone's B REIT which was responsible for over 70% of the activity multifamily industrial remain the largest targets as non-traded REITs prioritize income oriented and defensive assets to provide consistent and reoccurring distributions makes sense it's something that i've seen you know as you know where we've been dipping our toes more and more into the institutional um, space mat here at Gray Capital yeah. and kind of looking at you know who is allocating to what Blackstone is just, you know, obviously it's the, you know, it's the eight, not 800 pound gorilla. It's like the 8,000 pound, yep. you know, gorilla because, you know, they just, they have such a brand recognition mm -hmm. and that what I've seen, you know, talking to pension funds and endowment funds and these private equity groups is that there's just a level of, I, I think that they feel like they'll, they will not receive criticism for going with a black Rocket, mm -hmm. it's like the safe bet. It's got again, it's got the brand recognition, and they're not going to get that much scrutiny um, from their, you know, investment advisors, their boards, their investment committees, because like, oh, it's you know, it's BlackRock. It's got to be good, even though you're going to be paying, you know, an arm and a leg in fees. And you know, at some point, the challenge with deploying significant capital is at some point, it you can't, your returns are diminishing at some point because it's. A challenge in itself to find a good deal with a, a, a limited amount of capital mm -hmm. like you yeah, you can find deals but they're not all going to be good deals and then you have this mandate we just have to get the money out you just kind of you start settling for more moderate and mediocre deals because yeah. getting the not getting the money out is a bigger risk than doing just a moderate deal and just hoping that it's going to outperform and especially if you believe that the sector is so strong i think there's going to be sector tailwinds that'll push it forward but you know Having so many, everyone's investing in BlackRock, and again, it's just like the safe. Is it BlackRock or Blackstone? I know. Well, there's BlackRock and Blackstone. I get so confused. Yeah, their stones are. Oh, no, never mind. Well, they they had an original origin. Uh, it's a good Steve Schwartzman is a, it's a great book. Okay, uh, all right. What, gonna, what, what it takes, it. Yeah. and he, he explains the the difference um, and kind of how the two companies kind of split. Okay, I think it was like in the early 2000s, late 90s. So, but yeah, it's but Blackstones. I mean, they're they're both big players. Yeah. Blackstone is more in the um, like private real estate, private equity. Um, mm -hmm. BlackRock is a little bit more in the uh, publicly traded okay. stock portfolio management business. Unless I'm now, I'm probably like reversing Blackstone, BlackRock. Well, but, but I, I do think it is interesting about what you said about um, kind of maybe indirectly referencing dry powder and how people yeah. may be waiting for something and. You know, we've talked about this before. Is are they is is they're waiting? Are they really waiting for something? Are they waiting for something perfect? And yeah. when is that dry powder going to going to be like what yeah, conditions do we need to be? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's less of there are. I, I think there's two factors. Mm -hmm. One, it's what it's what you just said of that like 
some are probably waiting for the right deal and there's been uncertainty in a rising interest rate environment being a little more cautious not just doing deals yeah. um, a lot of groups have been doing that i mean we've kind of fallen that category of we're still doing deals but we're just a little bit more cautious but i i think it's more of like they can't find the deals mm-hmm. I, I don't think i think that they've there are, are deals to do that they, they would do them because they have mandates to do them. They've yeah. already had the money committed. People say, yeah, I want to invest in this asset class. You know, okay, go invest in this asset class. Yeah. So I think it's just in a, a being very difficult to find um, the opportunities. I'm sure they do have investment criteria and return criteria they have to they have to kind of at least meet, and that's also been challenging, but I think it's just probably the lack of deals on the market. Yeah. So we'll see if that changes. Yeah. Um, okay, so what to expect, and then we're going to move on, Matt. Um, but the, again, I think these are good insights and something to think about because we're all thinking about them. So what 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 does uh, what, what does Newmark? What do they expect? The combination, uh, or you want to take no, it? No, no, no. You got it. You got it. Uh, and I'm just reading here. The combination of persistent high inflation and slowing growth presents a nuanced challenge to property markets. Industrial and multifamily fundamentals are likely to provide resili- are likely to prove resilient given record low vacancies and strong secular drivers. In this context, shorter leases, lease terms are a boon. Office is more challenged as a weakening economy threatens to delay the office recovery. And retail, meanwhile, is perhaps the most surprisingly resilient owing to a shallow supply pipeline. Interesting. Yeah. Um, to combat inflation, FOMC is expected to continue to raise rates throughout 2022, with a short-term rate peaking around 3.5% early in 2023. The market is currently pricing in a quick Fed pivot to cutting rates thereafter with around 80 basis points in rate cuts priced in. Market expectations remain highly volatile, contributing to large swings in the 10-year Treasury bond as well as other financial benchmarks. Now, the next what to expect is rising rates have already forced an adjustment in the CRE debt cost, both floating and fixed rate. While the 10-year Treasury yield has fallen recently on rising uh, recession expectations, CRE lending rates have been far less responsive to the same recession fears and lead lenders to determine more risk compensation. The end result is that debt costs over the next 12 to 24 months are likely to remain significantly higher than they were until recently. This, in turn, has already placed upward pressure on cap rates, particularly in negative leverage sectors like multifamily and industrial. And we've talked quite a bit about that, Matt. Yeah. Now, investors are using limited or no leverage or expect to have a considerable advantage bidding on and winning deals during the remainder of 2022, particularly in negative leverage situations and when interest rate volatility impacts financing. Similarly, properties with accretive, assumable debt will attract preferential valuations and liquidity. All true things that we're seeing today in the market. Um, now, while deal volumes have been extremely strong in the first half of the year, we expect activity to slow as a result of the change in the economic outlook and macro financial conditions. In past periods of financial pressure and recession, activity has dropped sharply. We expect the slowdown to be more measured as there have been a greater willingness on the part of sellers to adjust pricing expectations compared to part past market inflections. Above average price appreciation over the last several years means that even with recent reductions in value, investors, especially in multifamily industrial, have high levels of unrealized gains, thus facilitating dispositions even in the face of market uncertainty. So it's saying, hey, look, like, yeah, you may may get a small price cut from like the top number that you were thinking right now today, but you're still like knocking out of the park in in terms of returns. Yeah, that cushions the blow a little bit. It it certainly certainly does. Um, So I think they're right on track. I think that a lot of what we expect are kind of what we are seeing today. It's Mm -hmm. not necessarily too far in the future outside of some of those rate, um, some of those rate cuts. Yeah. what would you like to talk to him? What would yeah, you like to so feature on this the report page next, on, Matt? Um, the, the following page talks about CRE performance and inflation. Yeah. And um, and one of their lines, it says that only in 1991 and 2009 recessions did CRE fail to beat inflation. I think uh, the only in that sentence is doing a lot of work. Um, but to put it another way, since 1979, there have been six years when real estate returns did not beat inflation, according to this graph. Now, the graph here represents the average returns for all commercial real estate, but there is a four-year period from 1990 through the end of 1993 where real estate returns did not outpace inflation. That's a pretty long stretch. It's not something that you can kind of get over. You can really find yourself in the wrong spot when um, when, a, when that period is so extended like that. Um, 
I did, this did remind me, as a lot of things have, about um, Bercadia's work earlier this year. Um, they covered similar, similar territory in yeah. a report um, that we actually did mention last week. And these and the studies from Ber Bercadia actually support Newmark's take, um, kind of uh, minimizing the threat of, of a, a CRE not outpacing inflation. Basically, uh, Bercadia said that CRE as a whole is an inflation-resistant asset class with multifamily on the more inflation-resistant side. Um, but for, you know, that, that four-year period in 1991 is, is particularly... Uh, and and, and it seems like they're, they're related less to inflation, although they're certainly uh, correlated, but more to recessions, and especially in 2009, into 2008, 2009, you know, kind of a real estate crisis, um, and then the recession, which led to a drop in CRE prices in mm -hmm. the early 90s. At the same time, we were seeing some moderate levels of inflation, and they were rising interest rate, raising interest rates in that time. Yeah, that well. that period in the early 90s was particularly bad. It was a it was kind of a stagflationary period yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of that kind of explains a little bit. Um, and, and I think that on the following page there is a look at, yes, investor allocation over time. It's interesting to see how industrial investment has not continued to grow at the same rate as multifamily. Now, their returns, which we'll see in a second, um, their, their returns for industrial have been great, but, but it has not, it, it's kind of stagnated and gone down a little bit, um, the investment volume for industrial, whereas for multifamily just keeps going up and up and up. Yeah. Um, now, when you look at the, uh, I think it's on page no, no, I'm sorry. Page page nine or page eight has the uh, it has the year over year difference in the addition to the total sales volume for for the first half of 2022. Yeah. What I'd love to see would be a list of top markets with the highest growth in investment sales. But this one does have a um, it looks at the top markets for sales volume, which Dallas is the clear leader here. Um, but it also has, you know, you can see how much a, a given market has increased uh, the percentage uh, of year over year increase in investment spending and Manhattan has increased more than 150 percent um, in the past year uh, that, that's incredible it, it, it kind of makes sense just because like everyone was so bearish on New York City mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic yeah and and people were like oh you know New York's New York's dead and then I think people were like yeah may, may, maybe not it's the yeah. financial capital of the world I mean that's and, a and real maybe, big maybe uh, that's a real you know, big highlight to this kind of return to normal or whatever it is, but people are returning. Uh, maybe that means that we're, that, you know, we're in the pandemic recovery. It's a pretty it, big increase. It is a pretty big increase. Now, the um, on page fourteen, we yeah. we get back to the this relationship between cap rates and interest rates. Um, they. Essentially, their point is that the BAA corporate bond rate is a leader, leading indicator for cap rates, yep. and it has gone up recently, which suggests that we'll see upward cap rate pressure for CRE assets in the future. I'm not sure how or that this will play out in, in the same way for all asset types. I, st I also don't know, you know, I, the great big question mark on multifamily and industrial properties that they, they see multifamily and industrial as the most uh, amenable to yeah. cap rate expansion. But man, I just looking at multifamily investment, the investor intention keeps going up and up and up for multifamily. Yeah, that, and that's what's going to, that and the rents keep rising also. Yeah. So the top line revenue increases, the demand for the, demand for apartments from the user side, mm -hmm. single family homes are expensive is going up, and then also trying to outpace inflation, solid asset class. Yeah. Yeah, and no, then multifamily is definitely a kind of favored spot to be. Now, I will note that in this chart here, Matt, it mm -hmm. ends in March of 22. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's like right when rates started moving and I right was, when yeah. we started seeing some cap rate expansion. It hasn't like gone up, like it's not crazy cap rate expansion mm -hmm. as we've just, just we've learned just through price discovery and working on projects and just being in touch with brokers all across the country. Um, you know, where we were in the maybe the three and a half to four and a half range. Now we're maybe in the you know, four to five percent range. So, you know, maybe we've moved up, you know, 25 to 50 basis points. Um, but it, again, you know, there's also all this top line NOI growth as well. But with this, you know, triple B, trip, a B, triple B, double A corporate bond yield. I mean, you'd have to at some point again, like if you're you're looking at competition for for yield and at some point investors who are looking for income will move over to corporate bonds or municipal bonds if hmm. those rates are much more attractive especially yeah. municipal bonds because there's you know the um the tax savings tax advantages for those as as well yeah I, and another point that I, I mean apart from the 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 bonds is uh, i think that 
industrial could be a lot more vulnerable than multifamily because of the way that you know their investment is a little bit stagnated and multifamily it was a much more vol more volatility in terms of like the there's so much cap rate compression in a short period of time yeah. whereas multifamily has been kind of on like on a steady steady um de decline yeah um so but you see i mean industrial took this just like large plum i mean it's been steadily declining as well but you know, took a very large plunge kind of in you know right around the pandemic where it dropped yeah. from kind of a you know five some cap rate to you know four sub four um but you know multifamily just kind of steadily going down but when they update this i there will be at least a little bit of a take up um that 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 is for sure yeah Seven on page seventeen. Um, th I've been referencing this <laughs> excitedly. It's, it shows the uh, total returns by property type, um, which you know I think I think that pairs well a little bit with the they had bar graphs for the investor. Uh, you know how much investment is in each property type. Now we're getting to see the total returns and industrial for as stagnant as it was. It is far and away the the returns leader. Um, yeah. Now multifamily is not you know not doing too shabby. It's a solid second um, and. Uh, but uh, and retail and office aren't aren't doing too poorly. Um, and uh, I think what's interesting is that yeah, retail office is kind of yeah. Mm, they're both. Well, I, I mean, was I was actually a little bit surprised that office didn't go into the negatives, whereas retail and hospitality in 2021 retail was down um, negative 7.5 and hospitality was down 25.6. Yeah, th th that makes sense to me though because I mean, in for hospitality, I mean. People just don't show up. You can't book the yeah. room. We're office. Like you still, those businesses are paying their rent for the most part. Yeah. Most, most like businesses like still paid their rent. Um, some of the retail side, those are some of those us users um, and tenants. They, you know, stopped paying rent or was mm. asking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That was much more widespread. Um, but now widespread or sorry, office just like is the whole, <laughs> the future of office is still yeah. in question right now yeah um I, I don't think that it's on you know life support and like offices are going to go away but people are certainly just like rethinking how we're going to use the yeah. office especially the, you know large firms yeah the store and, and like i almost feels like a cliche to talk about remote work after two years of, yeah. of it but like the story about of, of remote work is not over i was into it i went to an office um this week matt um mm. uh, at a it was a hospital like administration office but like their head office and I was meeting with the CEO and like there was nobody working in the office. Man. I mean it was a hospital, I guess, so obviously yeah. they had health concerns. Tell but health. like <laughs> yeah. But there was there was nobody there. I mean it was like the CEO was there who I was yeah. meeting and that was it. I've I have been curious about medical office and and how telehealth might impact it, but man, it's not it's not limited to a specific industry if no if yeah, that's a good question. You telehealth and me medical office. Um, I, I'm less concerned because I think that the tail there's certain things. And I, yeah. my, my father in law is a dermatologist, mm -hmm. and I was talking to him about this like a week or so ago. And like, he's, there's so many of the things that they do like have to be done in yeah. person. Like, sure, there's some things that yeah we can do over a quick like call. But so he's a dermatologist, and so he's used to people being like you know taking a picture of like you know this rash or something, yeah. and, and you know he'll look at it and he'll be like uh, you know I think it's this, but he, but a lot but a lot of and this is like just family. Hey, you mm -hmm. know, can can you is this poison ivy yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. and a lot of times he's like uh, I think it's this. You know, I it's one of these things you can try this you know cream or whatever, but. Most of the time he's like, I need to take a look at it. Like yeah. I, I have to be there in person. And it's mm -hmm. like your your dad's an anesthesiologist. Like you had, you're not tele. You can't, yeah, <laughs> you're not you're not you telehealthing into that. So those knobs and yeah, and, 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 and then I don't know, maybe, maybe yeah, but, yeah. You, know, you could. But but then <laughs> at the same time we have you know the demographic shifts of you know just the silver tsunami, baby boomers. Yeah. Saw a graph of like the percentage of the U.S. population that's 65 and over, and just in the last couple of years that's just skyrocketed. Uh, hmm. So, you know, those folks are there, there are just more overall users uh, of healthcare in general. And so need to be able to have the facilities to service them. And yeah. that's the demographic that's not necessarily going to be signed up for telehealth also. Yeah. Maybe for a checkup, like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm feeling sore throat, yeah. you know, which I do. But good point. A little bit of the divergence, but I think it's good. We don't talk a lot about medical office. And it's one asset class that I invest in that mm -hmm. doesn't usually get fe featured because it's like a sub 
category of office, but I'm glad we did talk about it. Um, his medical office has actually done um, quite well in the last uh, year or so, quite a bit of cap rate compression as well. It, it can be a tough um, nut to crack to kind of get in. There's not a lot mm. of operators. It's a little bit different risk profile, but yeah. pretty defensive in general. Yeah, it seems like it would be pretty resistant to risk. Yeah, I, I think you know telehealth is is almost like wishful thinking for people that have waited in so many lobbies and waiting rooms. But, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, you can't do it if you just want a question. You can't get your doctor on the phone, and you know that 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 makes sense. Yeah, look, I want to take a look at this dry powder again, real quick, mm -hmm. Matt. Before we before we move on, um, again, the dry dry powder is you know only moving up you know it's been steadily moving up this is for all cre um but you know, we're at 254 um billion dollars right billion dollars yeah yeah i had to make sure anytime i put the b in there i have to you know it, so it, it says that it exceeds 2019 levels by 25.6 percent it's 254 now it used to be last year it was at 242 um and it's just steadily increasing and if you look at the pre-pandemic um, this the steadiness of this increase in dry powder is uh, is unusual and it's it it is a divergence from the typical patterns. There's a little bit of ups a little bit yeah, more up ups and downs yeah. uh, every year. But man, since actually since 2017, things have gone up and up and up. Yeah, and again, that that's just it's going to act as an anchor for cap rates. Yeah, for sure. So um, then let's look at kind of what people how what, what leverage people are using dry powder at 65 percent leverage um, because you got that cap. You've got the the equity, you know, ready to go the cash, but you're going to lever that up. So what does that actually you know look like? I mean, that's just for multifamily. That's one hundred ninety four billion dollars ready to go, ready to deploy, um, you know, into into mm -hmm. assets and about one hundred billion for um, industrial. Um, w one piece of this report, Matt, that I thought was really interesting, something that we have been tracking, so I was pleased to see this, is taking a look at all the debt that's going to be expiring in the next couple of years. Because, again, there was so much bridge um, financing and there was so much um, debt fund um, financing. And a lot of that's coming due in 23 and 24. And a lot of those were variable rates. Mm. And the rates that they – and if they – were or weren't um if they had a cap you know that cap was cheaper and the cap's much more expensive now and if they have to refinance the just the rates are higher than they yeah. were a couple of years ago without a doubt and you've had a lot of revenue growth but maybe you can't refinance because you need a higher typically a higher dscr you know if you're going to go for a supplemental you may not be able to just because of the debt has changed. You know, you're on pace yeah. of your income and that op, you know, where your you know, so revenue like, and rents. In my simple minded explanation. Yeah. So like these people have a good loan. They had a good loan. And now that loan is it, it, the term is is finishing. And so they don't want to get a bad loan. No, it's not necessarily bad loan. It's just that like there's it, a higher rate. It, it's it, it's the business plan going forward with mm -hmm. the higher rate may not make as much sense. Okay. And so they they probably have seen asset appreciation um, almost certainly. And so they are faced with two options. Typically, it's either you know, sell or sell or hold. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at holding and refinancing at a new rate. They may not get the loan proceeds in order to return any capital. And you don't necessarily okay. have to return any capital. When we look at buying something and refinancing it our goal is typically we want to see a nice return of capital to pay back down um you know our investors our investors equity mm -hmm. to kind of de-risk the asset to some degree not always sometimes you know we use for example if we're pursuing a hud 22 hud 223f loan those take so long to put in place that you have to close on a bridge loan mm -hmm. but we we so we close on the property we're using a short-term bridge loan but we've already been working on the refinance paperwork before we typically even close on the property yeah. and so we close on the new loan within you know six to 12 months you know, depending on how quickly hud wants to work okay in that scenario we're not looking at a cash out because it's the time period is so short um but it, so if you're going to refinance in two or three years you've seen the asset appreciate in value but you're not going to be able to return cash to investors you're just going to kind of roll the debt but it's going to maybe be at a higher interest rate. So your cash flow is going down because yeah. you bring on more debt at a higher interest rate and you're seeing the cash flow doesn't look that good. And, you know, you could go for a floating rate and buying a cap, but the caps are incredibly expensive. The mm -hmm. fixed rate will 
um, maybe give you more security and not having any rate volatility, but you're going to have a, a decent prepayment penalty. And so you're looking at, okay, we're going to have, we can't sell this thing and maybe refinance for another five to 10 years, or we could sell it now and book a profit for our investors. Yeah. And they're, and they're seeing that the idea of selling it and booking a profit is more creative than rolling the debt and doing a longer term hold in some scenarios. Yeah. And so, so many people have been using bridge loans, especially again, the last couple of years because they were more flexible. Um, the agencies weren't as competitive um, and you didn't always have to buy a cap and you could finance some of your renovation costs. So there are all these great things about bridge loans until all of a sudden, you know, the low rate you thought you were going to be paying is actually going to be twice because interest rates are being risen by, you know, 50, 75 basis points. Well, from the perspective a of a buyer, you and you've mentioned, you know, a lot of people skate and buy on low rates, and maybe they didn't, you know, run as tight a ship as they even had to, yeah. because uh, because money was so plentiful and available. Yeah. So maybe we're gonna get we're gonna find some of those loans expiring. Well, that's what they're showing here on this report is that you see this big uptick of the kind of zero to three year. Those would be the bridge loans that are going to be expiring. Mm. It's big chunk in 2023. That's from bridge yeah. loans that were taken out in 2021 and 2022, or mostly 2021. Then some they're going to be expiring in 2024. And you see how it just drops off because obviously you can't have a there's not a three. There aren't any two year loans that are coming due in uh, four years, um, but you know, it makes up a big, big percentage. And I, I assume this is going to drop just because bridge financing all of a sudden, maybe not that it's not attractive because mm -hmm. it still is, but there's more risks associated with okay. it than there were um, in, in previous kind of economic conditions. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I'm glad you know. So this. I, this could be a buying. I, this is what we're looking out for, for a very strong buying opportunity. And yeah. just through our own independent research, um, through some of our own data sets, we've, we've seen this ourselves is that 2023 and 2024, there's going to be quite a few loans expiring. And we think there might be some very good pickups at that point. So that's, that's really cool. We'll be on the lookout for that. Um, I highly recommend read this whole report. Um, make sure you're signed up to the Gray Report newsletter. You can sign up at graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter. Um, or you can go to grayreport.com, get all this stuff up to date every single day. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel, get in the podcast, leave a comment. We'd love to communicate with you. Uh, Matt, let's move on because, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on that for good reason. But real page analytics blog is U.S. rank growth at a peak. Matt, what, 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 what say what say you? You know, uh, fine. Fine. It's at a peak. <laughs> I think um, when there's unusual growth, there's got to be a starting and ending point to that growth. Otherwise, it would just be usual growth. So, yes, every time that there is some every time that there is like. An un what goes up must come down yeah, type thing up, yes peaks and, and troughs and the question is rent growth at a peak doesn't have to be a scary one and really anyone who's paid attention to the apartment market this year uh will know that rent growth is not as high as it is as it was in 2021 so uh yeah it probably has peaked and rent growth will not be as strong as it used to be um the question here is what are things going to look like coming off this peak and i've argued and i and i think I think fairly persuasively <laughs> that it's not going to look like a you know a plummet down to the negatives or anything. It's not it's not going to be a cool down. It's it'll be a moderating um, you know kind yeah. of a slow gradual uh, drift downwards. This uh, this article likewise it doesn't really give a definitive answer other than to suggest that in place rent growth will likely recede in the coming months um, after posting four. Straight months of gains. Um, the chart that it accompanies this report is actually really interesting. Um, and while the article is mainly concerned with overall rent growth trends, it also serves as, as a little bit of a, a primer on the different um, on the different ways to measure rents and the and the typical trends associated with these measures. Yeah, that's something I was interested. Um, well, just, and we talk about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, Matt. Give us a so um, give us a break. the most common the most common one that that we see is asking rents and that's what what you'll charge a new renter looking for an apartment and um, and it compares the so and for this chart it, it compares what was the asking rent this year versus what was the asking rent last year yeah and so when, new someone I'm looking for an apartment I'm walking in off the street how much is the two bedroom mm -hmm. yeah and um, the asking rents it, so it was. 
that number peaked in 15%, sorry, in 2022, as this chart shows, um, before kind of settling down to 13.7. It, it, it didn't sink down. Well, so it was asking rent, down. So asking rent is not, it's not, someone's not necessarily signing a lease. It's just what you're asking, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, now, the next, the next measurement is the new lease trade out. Uh, they call it new, true new lease trade out, but I think it's just commonly, right? It's like new lease trade outs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I think there's, they're differentiating from their asking rent. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So this is actually comparing what a new renter would would pay for a uh, would pay for a lease versus what that what a previous renter was paying yeah, for the on, lease. on renewal. Yep. And when you're looking at the volatility, this new lease trade out number is the most volatile. It, you can see this. Uh, it follows seasonal trends yeah. so perfectly. Yeah. And. And you you see these bigger swings. And before the pandemic, new lease trade outs almost perfectly follow that. It's it is uh, it's down in December, up in June. It's like this nice yep. little sine wave yep. um, every year. And at the start, and this is what I think is really interesting. It shows that like seasonal trends are still present because at the start of the pandemic, and I'll just kind of the story mm -hmm. of this volatility. At the start of the pandemic, new lease trade outs were the first to trend downwards, and then they were also the first to to zoom back upwards. Um, but you can still see see traces of seasonality here. So its low point was in December 20th at around negative 3%. But instead of going up 3% like the typical seasonal trend, it zoomed up 21%. Yeah, yeah. And then it sank down a little bit in December 21 and then it and then it grew back in um, to to 18% in June 22. Uh, 2022, and then now it looks like it's heading back down in a, in a kind of a seasonal way. Well, what's interesting is that the there's a little bit of catch up that's going on. So you can see that in the actual new lease, uh, new true new lease rent compared to the asking rent is that they're not necessarily asking for that much more, but they're mm -hmm. actually getting it now yeah. on their on their actual new leases, and then renewals are also really starting to you know more steadily um, come up, and then we're seeing you know the in place rent. Kind of the combination of both of those renewals yeah. and you know new leases just kind of i mean it's kind of going up at a that geez, was yeah. i mean that's like a, skip, it's a pretty steep angle yeah to skip ahead they also yeah they also talk about uh renewal rents which compares you know what was someone that lived in the same place what were you paying last year versus what are you paying um in your most recent you know in, in this year and the the renewals are, are one of the most stable measurements here and it's not really moving um, yeah. moving with the swings of, of trade outs at all no I, I think a lot of apartment owners have been um, uh, they've been conscious of the fact that you know there's no need to they're balancing wanting to retain you know good residents who've been you know at the property for a while um, you know paying on time then also the, there's a huge divergence in some of these um, in place rents in the current market rents and so renewals are being Ray, the rents are on renewals are up higher than your typical. Like a lot of times, there's like a non like twenty five dollar like yeah. renewal rent increase. But now it's like, well, maybe we're not going to bring you all the way to market, but like we need to do something. Yeah. So it's you know maybe it's going to be a um, you know five percent, eight percent, ten percent increase. That's better than the maybe fifteen to twenty percent increase. Yeah. It's still it's still moving up there, but I mean the, the, just the price of everything. Has changed. Yeah. So well, and that's and, and then so just kind of following at the at the least reactive at the most stable is this CPI measure of rent of primary residence, and that's where we get into the you know my claim um, from last week is that that uh, rents are going to drive inflation, and because you see it you know reacting so slowly, there's a there's a big argument to be made that we haven't seen the end of CPI rent of primary residence. Yep. The way that the CPI measures is rent inflation. Yeah, it's going to be lagging, and there's still room for that to increase in the coming months yeah fascinating man um all right let's uh see what's going on msci how the u.s real estate purchases changed during the pandemic i mean uh, i definitely <laughs> noticed quite a bit of difference yeah. pre-pandemic post-pandemic and whatever we're in right now so i'm curious about their conclusions um what, what did brian reed have to say yeah so this is a little bit of a review of stuff that we we've noticed this and maybe everyone's noticed it um office activity was down people did move uh to the suburbs specifically they they um they say that 
uh, people are moving kind of to secondary and tertiary markets. Um, it says what, that while most investors tended and in, tended to invest in industrial and multifamily assets, real estate investment trusts REITs recorded a greater share of office and lower share of industrial uh, um, and residential purchases compared to 2019. The share of retail purchases also increased slightly for closed ended funds. So um, it looks like people are it looks like these REITs are really searching for opportunities here and they um and i would i would love to know why they are um why they aren't joining joining the crowd and, and investing in these popular multifamily and industrial assets um, reeds yeah i mean we just saw the um blackstone well blackstone but it's a, but their argument here is that is that real estate had less uh had Inflows. a greater share of office and oh, lower yeah. share of industrial apartment purchases, and I'm just yeah, I'm interested to see. I'd love to know why why those decisions were made, but yeah, no, I, I, some REITs are just focused on those asset classes, yeah. and you know they probably saw an opportunity. If you were a office focused mm -hmm. REIT, you know, I guess the the price the price was right, um, but. Yeah, that, that that is that is interesting for sure. I mean, multifamily and industrial still make up a pretty um, decent per, decent chunk, um, yeah. but there's definitely a big difference between the listed REITs and the broader market. That that's that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's ninety percent um, for in twenty nineteen, only thirteen percent in twenty twenty uh, through twenty one for apartments. Broader market, you know, twenty 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 through twenty one is almost forty percent. So yeah, that is a big, that is a good question. Um, and then the other story that they that they talk about here is that um, purchase activity shifts shifted away from larger coastal gateway markets towards the secondary and tertiary markets. Um, and in 2019, purchases in Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, New York, San Francisco, Washington, accounted for 24.3 percent of total volume. But this declined to 19.7 percent in 2020 2021. Um, so a little bit of a shying away. Yeah, um, a little bit of a movement, as it were. A little bit of movement. <laughs> well, people are moving all over the place, Ooh, nice. Matt. Um, Redfin <laughs> has a recent report: the share of home buyers looking to relocate jumped to new records in July. As you were saying earlier, you know, we thought this was more a story of the pandemic, but um, it has not ceased. And I don't yeah. know what the conclusions are in Redfin if it's more of an affordability um, uh, factor or or what, but. Um, I curious think, of the results for the red redfin study i think you hit the nail on the head i i think that that's what's driving it is people are seeing and and yes it's just an interest in mobility and then we talked about how you know sentiment is not necessarily in, related to action um but i think in this case you know you're allowing yourself to be interested in it um and, and that is probably due to maybe people's conditions have improved with a tighter tighter labor market mm -hmm. um when the Sorry. Right now, 33.7% of home buyers are interested in relocating. The pre-pandemic number was 26.3%. Now that's yeah. a pretty big shift. Um, again, it's just yeah. an interest, but yeah, it's, it's, it's people looking. So they're popping mm -hmm. on Redfin. They're in Los Angeles or wherever, and Redfin sees that they're looking at houses in in Austin or yeah. Indianapolis. Now or we wherever. thought this is what everyone I'm, like at the beginning of the pandemic. People's imaginations they, they moved a lot faster than than people were actually moving. Yeah, it was it was a lot of anecdotes of like I know somebody or I've heard of somebody talking about it, and I mean we saw it. I mean it's like there was an exodus from New York down to Miami. It seemed like and you know out of California well, which it, had been going, going on for a while and there were also these like think pieces where people were you know waxing philosophical about yeah go down oh, the cabin in the woods and do my transcending tech job. transcending the workplace uh what yeah. does that mean oh well it's unshackled <laughs> it's a work from home nirvana yeah that sounds <laughs> um so yeah this is it is it's interesting people are thinking about moving i think that this has got to be like man my rent just increased or mm -hmm. you know the homes in this area i i'm not going to be able to afford yeah what are my other options um i there was a, a report recently um uh, a story I, i'm blanking on the on the on the source on the, in the outlet but a study on uh, americans moving to mexico and mm -hmm. to mexico city in particular um because of the cost of living um i heard someone say that you know they were living in los angeles they were paying 2400 dollars a month for their studio apartment they can get a two bedroom in Mexico City for like eight hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Now the local residents in Mexico City aren't that happy because they're raised, the prices are being yeah. risen. That's interesting. <laughs> they're not speaking Spanish. Yeah. And uh, so I thought I'm like 
this is this is an interesting situation where yeah. it's usually reversed. Um, but you know, I can I can see the appeal. Yeah. Well, and 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 I think the thing that that really lets people move in the first place is this higher these higher wages, as true. we've mentioned. True. You know, we've seen reports in the past that show how higher income individuals are both more likely and and more able to relocate mm-hmm. um, compared to lower income. So if a strong job market is raising income, then you could see more people seriously considering the possibility of relocating and buying a house somewhere else yeah um do you want to let's look just briefly kind of where mm-hmm. people are um where, where are they where are they looking where, where are they looking to go um there's some some of the the conclusions aren't too surprising um so this is looking at you know the rank of you know either portion of searches from users outside the metro or portion of searches from users outside the metro sorry 22 compared to 2021 okay miami florida um, still top of the list. I understand why. And again, all the everyone from New York and other places and baby boomers retiring. Wow, um, that 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 that's that's a lot. Um, the percentage of searches from outside the area is thirty four percent. So it's so kind of a tourist destination, second home yeah. de- destination. Sacramento also not too surprising. People are um, leaving high priced, um, you know, San Francisco Bay Area, moving to Sacramento. Say, S- Sacramento is not typically. On the, among the high flyers in terms of market rent growth, but uh, they have been uh, off there. and on. They they have been off and on the past couple of years okay. because um, again people are want to stay in California and they're like oh, looking for you know yeah. Bay Area is way too expensive. San Diego, you know, that's interesting, but San Diego is not cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's a cheaper than L.A. like slightly in lifestyle thing. Tampa, Florida, not surprised yeah. surprising there. Again, that's lifestyle um, cost a little bit, although it's gotten expensive. Um, almost half the people move, that are searching in Tampa are from out of town. Forty. Yeah, that's incredible. Las Vegas. Um, a lot of people. Again, that's a California story. Um, Phoenix, Arizona, similar California story. And then we've got a couple markets in Florida. Um, Cape Coral, Florida. Seventy percent of the people searching are from out of that market. Um, Portland, Maine. Sixty-four percent of folks searching that market are not in Portland, Maine. Um, I don't know if that's a, like a New York thing, East Coast, like all, yep. it's like all of the high cost, um, East, Northern, Eastern seaboard yeah. markets. I wonder if that, if that city there on the, on the right, oh, where, that's they're, like, where they're searching. Yeah. I wonder if that's what it is. Oh, before I, without messing it up in OBX. Yeah. Th- this table here on their website is a little, um, it's not, it's not before. as easy. So you, you're, I'm glad you pointed that out, Matt, um, because it, it is. So like in San Antonio, people are thinking about moving from Austin. It's funny. People get to Austin and they're like, it's too expensive now. <laughs> yeah, or they're yeah, like, yeah. I don't like Austin anymore. Let's move to San that Antonio, Portland, Maine. Yeah. So it's a, it's a Northeast, you know, people from Boston or, you know, Chicago, it's cold. Let's move to Florida. That's mm-hmm. a Midwest thing that, that, that makes sense. Um, and, um, so we, we could have done like a guessing like where people are coming from. Yeah. And I think we did pretty, we're doing it in reverse good, now. Yeah. I think we did pretty decent decent job so phoenix yeah it's a los angeles story las vegas it's a los angeles story um this is interesting people from orlando were thinking about moving to tampa i guess it's not too far away the price and decrease, probably slight price decrease. yeah i guess i guess i, yeah. I, guess. I, th- I think it seems like a, somewhat a somewhere, wash but i think <laughs> yeah that's that, that's interesting san diego los angeles story sacramento san francisco miami new york story so did i get like, yeah, like yeah. maybe nine for nine i think the tampa and florida the Tampa, Orlando to Tampa, I missed that. Yeah. But, um, and then I guess on the other Florida options, I wasn't really sure, but so. Yeah. De- decent. It decent, is interesting. Decent I, batting average. I like, I like this extra data that they sometimes include in all these Redfin reports. Yeah. Um, they used to have a comparison of mortgage, uh, of mortgage, average mortgage payment. That's right. Alongside rents. That's and, right. Um, I, I can only hope I can see That's that right. in the next rent report. Okay, just to um, square things off, got an interesting story and report um, that Matt has been (laughs) on top of tracking closely. Um, It's related to the whole WeWork story, Adam Newman. Um, I've heard this kind of shuffling around a little bit and the idea that he is going to be disrupting the multifamily industry. He's already a big multifamily investor, it sounds like. But Matt, give us a little bit of background. Who who Adam um, Newman is and 
what's going on with him and multifamily. Before we get into the story, I want to be sure yep. that we're approaching this as okay. dispassionately as, as possible. Yeah. So, you know, like when I, I comment on, on Adam Newman's new business venture, I want to avoid the idea that like, you know, since we're already in the multifamily mm-hmm. industry, we don't want to be punching down. Yeah. Um, there are this punch, humble. Is that would we be punching down? He's hey, like, they're a humble new company. Like, they don't have experience. They're an upstart. He's got that SoftBank or had that SoftBank money. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to yeah, care we're, we're, for these newborn we're welcoming. businesses. That's yeah, what, yeah, yeah, and new ideas, new ideas. Exactly. Is yeah, all let's about hope, it. Let's hope he's a subscriber of the Great Report. We can kind of catch him up on things. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. I. It's, but anyways, let's just just for some background for Adam Newman. Now, WeWork was the previous company that Adam Newman found and was later ousted from a little more than three years ago for inappropriate behavior, irresponsible business practices. Um, you can you can watch the, uh, the the documentary We Failed for a little bit of a uh, of a primer on that. But for a quick and dirty snapshot yeah. of kind of who Adam Newman is, here's a wonderful uh, a wonderful sentence that comes at the end of his Wikipedia entry. Oh yeah, good. good. The Wall Street Journal reported in 2019 that Newman had aspirations to live forever, become the world's first trillionaire, expand WeWork to the planet. At Mars, become Israel's prime minister, and become president of the world. You know what? This is what dreams are made of. I was gonna say, hey, you gotta have some dreams and yeah. some some goals. Those are those some good. Those are some good ones. Needless you to say, maybe pick one or two. <laughs> those yeah. lofty dreams had well, maybe a little basis in reality. But who's to say that Newman's next dream? won't be realized. Certainly not Andreessen Horowitz, which has invested $350 million in its biggest f- ever first round of funding. Um, Adam Neumann's going to disrupt housing. Uh, not in the horrible way that he disrupted the lives and livelihoods of people that worked at WeWork. Not in that way. Not in like not like he's bad in the workplace and really disrupting, throwing things all around yeah. and, and telling people what to do and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a better way. It's like the disruption of like making money disruption. That's what I'm, I, I'm assuming. That oh, right. okay. Is this, so is this his, is this their, their company? Is this their company? Anderson Horowitz? That's, that's Anderson Horowitz. That's the investment company that's investing in, um, in, in his flow. Deal. Now in you fl- can, in, in it's flow. so what, what is his company? What is his new so, company's name? It's called, well, the, I'm very. I'm glad that you mentioned that because the, this Anderson Horowitz blog post explains the current. Fee- so, Flow is entering the housing crisis, and the blog post from there, this 350 million dollar investment um, from Anderson Horowitz, Mark Andreessen explains what we're facing. Um, he says basically, right now for housing, you got two models. You're buying a house with decades-long mortgage, then you're stuck. You can't move. Even if your economic opportunity or life path wants to take you somewhere else, you're stuck. Now, I would I would point him to uh, our previous article that we just covered about mobility, but that's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I think this under, underestimates that a little bit, but moving on to model two. Um, the second model of housing is, is renting. You rent an apartment, but it's a soulless experience. Mm. Um, are you? Uh, uh, do you even meet your neighbors? Does it feel like home? Are you proud to bring family and friends to visit? Apartment renters, aren't you grateful and excited? Because and that's Adam Newman's exclusive. going to change everything. And He's that's going to mutually exclusive that. to apartments. He's going to inject the soul back into the home. Okay, now, cool. There's not much Soul's in this good. blog post to explain how this is going to happen, um, outside of vague statements about changing everything from the ground up. But here's a paragraph that I think gets the closest, and I'm going to hazard a guess. Here's my my super theory <laughs> about what it, it could mean. Um, it says doing this. Um, requires doing this, you know, revamping the housing uh, situation that they're that they're you know dreaming about. Doing this requires combining community-driven, experience-centric surface service with the latest technology in a way that has never been done before to create a system where renters receive the benefits of owners. This means rethinking the entire value chain from the way buildings are purchased and owned to the way residents interact with their buildings, to the way value is distributed among stakeholders. And given the fragmented nature of the ecosystem today, we can only hope to accomplish this by bringing every aspect of the living experience together. What do you think? Uh, so what? What is? That? Well, then I'm not going to give is, it away because I want to know what your what your impression so is. What do you think he's going to do? Is it some kind of like lease option? I think. I, I don't which think is it's like not because there are more than two ways. To, I don't think it's rent to own. Yeah. I think it's some some damn blockchain thing. Oh yeah. Well, why would it, why wouldn't it be? And but how? Why? What? I well because okay. <laughs> so the name of this is Flow. That. The name of this company Flo. is Flow. Yeah. And Newman like actually subscription service. I think that you're going to rent and you're going to earn a little. You're going to earn a little crypto on the side. You're going to generate crypto as because the, the ads themselves generate the revenue. Well, I, yeah, that's that's true. Well, and here's the thing: you, you can 
generate more crypto if you invite your parents over. You can generate crypto if you're if you wow. rid what? the soullessness yeah. of uh, your. So you're getting rewarded for these behaviors. That's that's my <laughs> that's my hot take. Well, it, so this group invested how much, and they can't really describe like what they're doing. Well, it's so early, but. <laughs> Because, I mean, is this like I I recommend, you know, again, subscribe to the Gray Report newsletter. This blog will be on there. It'll be on Gray Report. But like read this whole blog is is a bunch of just like just waxing on just it's just like stream of consciousness. Um, And I'm not. Oh, yeah. Click on flow. Let's click click on flow. Live life in flow. Live life and flow. Coming 2023. So they just have a landing page right now. We can contact them, though. I did already. You would contact them. Are they coming on the report? I hope. I'm in um, interested in living, partnering. Yes. Should we partner with Flow? Yeah, that's good. But um, while you partner, um, I do want to note that uh, this. You can shoot Matt an email. Flow. Matt Gray Capital LLC. You, know, you can even send me an email. This is like you know, right. this is like a, then this is fine. Um, what should what should our note be? Um, sign me, get me on the ground floor of their crypto coin. I'd love, I'd love that. Um, That'd, I'd be a nice ground, partner. Ground, well, they, yeah, ground floor of the crypto, yeah, crypto yeah. world. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm only saying this too because there is an eerie similarity between the name Flow and a earlier venture of May in this year that that Adam Newman had. Now, okay, we may not earn crypto coins for inviting your parents over uh, to your apartment. That may not happen with Flow, but. I but, do. but I'm wondering, it's like you could, if it's like some sort of like portable like lease and like mm-hmm. your move. I I, I I don't know if like you're you you the problem. It seems like they're attempting to solve is that there is the arrange the typical arrangement between um, tenants and landlords is that there is no equity for yep. the the renters, mm-hmm. and so how do we how do you build? equity in a maybe non-traditional sense um to actually create stakeholders and to have sense of ownership and i think that, yeah. that, that's all great but so our i mean not creating you know something out of nothing i mean like so the crypt like what is like you know the token is it like is it like the we are buying the real estate we are tokenizing it and a portion of those tokens are going that would to be renters the cleanest. and you'll have you hold on to that you rent somewhere else you just hold on to those or is there a, is there a market for those tokens how are they additional tokens gener- you know like and then and again like what's the at we on some of our apartments we can't get people to sign up for the yeah. resident portal then you're going to throw like crypto tokens at them to yeah. carry along like this might work in like san francisco mm-hmm. like like there's an apartment building like there might be some takers for this but if like your normal renter in the united states which again something if you're going to disrupt an industry it has to be like applicable yeah one like what is the real problem you're solving i think this is a little bit another solution in search of a problem yeah but even if there was a this was a problem to solve is this like the solution for like the average renter in america mm-hmm. that, like under you understand this have the yeah. time to to deal with it we don't even know what it is well and and to doubters that are doubting my hot take on on uh, on crypto earlier this year in may newman received seven seventy million dollars from anderson horwitz for a separate project called flow carbon which is as far as i can tell from Newman's descriptions, a crypto coin connected to carbon credits. Flow, flow carbon. It's got to be crypto. Okay. Yeah. He describes. Who's this group handing out money? Uh, it is called Anderson Horowitz. Okay. Are they um, real estate investors or are they like v- they're VC? I assume. Yeah, yeah. Because that doesn't sound like they understand real estate. Hey. Focus uh, area. American dyna- dynamism, biohealth, cultural leadership fund, consumer crypt- crypto. Enterprise, fintech, games, growth, talent, X, opportunity. Yeah, definitely not. You don't see well, real estate on there but, at all. You know, yes, yes, they may not. But this is an example of the multifamily world, specifically multifamily world, has become such an attractive asset class True. that it is drawing people from everywhere. And they even they even um, cite that in their in their blog posts as like, this is a huge asset class. Of course, yeah. of course, you want to no, dive into the, it. The, all jo- all joking aside, yeah. the multifamily industry is ripe for this dis- disruption. There mm-hmm. are so many inefficiencies. Like the bar is low. Like your average property manager, yeah. how property is managed. And, and we're working on that because we're building a property management company right now. Not to you know spoil any, any announcements, but you know there there's 
so the average it like par is like not great mm -hmm. on like terms of like how people manage and operate properties there's so much yeah. opportunity i mean you can just look at you know what the hospitality industry do, is doing and then student housing that there, there's a little bit a couple steps ahead of the multifamily industry yeah there's a tons of room for improvement well and there's dropping in a, a token i don't i don't i'm not sure if that really solves like the service issue like how are you gonna get the work order done on time yeah and there's lots of technologies really interesting sophisticated technologies in the prop tech world yeah and, and for property management that like I don't, you know, it's not like it's stagnated. There are options out there that may not be, definitely are not adopted yeah. across the industry, but it's not like it's, there's like nothing there. There's no options for people. Like there are things out there that the, that the average, you know, kind of syndicator can implement. It's just on that work that has to be done. Yeah. It doesn't, it may not require inventing a whole apparatus. It's just using the, these really cool tools that are out there. Yeah. I, I mean, I, the, the smart apartments like they've been around there's more that can be done again it's like some people care but some people don't care some people yeah. it, it's like more that they want to deal with mm -hmm. and so as long as the demand isn't there yeah. i think there are opportunities to make i mean again i went to a hotel room like a month or two ago and it's like you know there's an ipad there and everything mm. you control everything on the ipad i don't think you know there's much every apartment resident's going to want that in certain yeah. super high-end you know luxury assets like yeah that that would be attractive if like but how many apartments have you know motorized blinds and you know, yeah. you're, not, you know you're not integrating you don't you, they're not furnished typically unless you're, mm -hmm. you could do them furnished um, but th there's a line of diminishing returns for that stuff because just renters yeah. don't really care that much a lot of that stuff you can like install yourself maybe not like a thermostat but you know you can the yeah. light you want your light bulbs to turn a different color and automate your lights like sure that that makes yeah, sense that's a really good point like um, how much do you really want to live and maybe there's a metaverse component in this in this business too <laughs> I, oh i don't know that would oh, be the trifecta yeah, that so yeah so like you're like running your place but you get to like own it in the metaverse yeah and, yeah yeah there's your oh, there's this, your soul this is great well stay tuned because we're gonna have <laughs> updates on whatever the heck flow living is um hopefully the folks over at flow reach back out to us i probably yeah. won't after watching this but we'd love to have them on the great report it's fascinating I, I mean like again there's so many opportunities for disruption i'd love to yep. hear what they're actually doing and see if it actually um yeah. holds water or not maybe it doesn't um love for you to give a subscribe hit the subscribe button the like button on youtube if you're listening to the podcast we really appreciate it keep going leave a comment um we actually matt we've got a couple of comments we got to get to on the next episode oh, okay um they're all good stuff yeah. the one's asking a good couple good questions so on the next episode next week we're going to get to some of your comments so if you're seeing this before then drop in some more comments we will get right back to you i mean if you are an individual you're an institution ria pension fund family office just an, uh, an individual that's accredited if you'd like to learn more about what Gray Capital is doing in the multifamily investment space, um, I think we're making some really smart decisions and finding some great assets that we're going to be picking up here in the near future. Can't make any announcements on deals today, but hoping to make some announcements soon. If you want the sneak peek, get in touch with us. Go to gray.fund. You'll learn all about it. Um, you know, Again, download the deck, make, schedule a meeting with us, and uh, we'd love to meet and learn more about you. Again, only open to accredited investors. You know, we're buying only stabilized cash flowing apartments throughout the Midwest, um, business friendly, tax friendly markets, growing markets, mostly suburban. Um, yeah, in all the newer stuff, kind of B and A plus uh, or A, B and A class assets. So if that, that sounds something that would be interesting to you, um, you would like to learn more about the team because at the end of the day, it's kind of the team, the people doing it. Um, obviously, marketing property and all that's important, but who's actually running the deal. Um, we're a vertically integrated um, operator. I'm running our deals, construction, property management, asset management, uh, market intelligence, um, and research. It's all in-house. So you're not going to a middleman. You're, getting, you're going straight to the source. So get in touch with us. Again, go to gray.fun. I think I threw my email address up there at one point. Email me. Email Matt. Um, We'll catch you on the next episode of The Great Report. This is a good one, Matt. A little long. We're going to cut it up into a bunch of different That's clips right. and stuff. And so catch us next week. Have a good one.